Uh, Gooden Tag, it's me, Dr. McAvoy. It's not my real name, obviously. That's a sort of um, you know silly handle that I've given myself um, for for internet purposes. Um, look, I'm quite desperate to kind of get some money into this channel um, because my dream, of course, is to stop doing real work and start uh, making money doing nonsensical shit like this instead and and in order to do that i have actually acquired a sponsor um so this video is brought to you by blue sage incense um from satav and um all you need to know about this product is that it really is terrific at dealing with all a whole host of domestic odors um rotting corpses for example there are others but you know it's off the top of my head if you happen to have one in the home you could do worse so we're here to talk about star trek it was ever thus specifically star trek picard season three I don't know what you're thinking. You're thinking, but it's all over, isn't it? I mean, didn't that... It's finished. Why are we talking about it? And you're right that once something has uh, ceased transmission, all cultural uh, commentary and discussion of that thing should stop. But I've chosen to break that rule on this one occasion because I think there's a little bit more to be said. More to be said, you say? What, more than the thousands and thousands of words you've already written on the subject in your blog, you know, um, the blog that, that nobody reads, but that you can read by following the link in the description? Yes, that blog. But there is more to say, a little bit more to say. Not a huge amount, um, but I hope that uh, you'll indulge me. And even if you won't indulge me, well, you're here now, you may as well listen. So... Was it worth it, Picard, the series, at all? Did season three redeem the first two seasons? And in doing so, retrospectively validate the entire enterprise? <sighs> well, no, is the answer, um, as you ask. But we'll come to why that is. I'm not going to repeat most of the talking points in, in my blogs. I didn't write them just so I could lazily regurgitate them in a video. I demand you do a little bit of work. I demand you go online and actually read the fucking things as I took the trouble to write them. So don't think that by watching this, you don't need to read the blog because I've got to kind of summarise what I said. I'm not. This is what we call an addendum. Okay. So let's start by talking about the kind of bricolage, postmodern uh, approach to Picard season three, um, which is a very fancy and erudite way of saying that they ripped it off. They ripped it off from other sources. It's it's all stolen stuff, imported stuff from the, the stuff that they love. Now, you could say, well, hang on a minute. Um wasn't Picard season one and two a bit like that? Didn't they? Did that sort of riff off things we already knew about? A bit in a clueless way? Yeah. Sure. The writers of Picard season three. Though some of them were the same people from Picard season two. Were sort of empowered to to indulge their um, fan-like credentials. Okay, They were emboldened, if you like, because they didn't have... The dead hand of Alex Kurtzman on their shoulder. They were free. He didn't care. He said, yeah, sure, Terry Metalis. Sure, indulge yourself. Enjoy yourself. It's only one season. Do what you want. Well, what did he want? Well, what Terry Metalis and co. wanted was to kind of recreate something they loved from their own childhood. Mainly the three original series movies that form a trilogy, Star Trek 2, 3 and 4. I know exactly how Terry Metalis feels about those movies. I love them myself. 
And they are the gold standard as far as the sort of quintessential Star Trek experience is concerned. They're big, they're grandiose. There's deep feeling and emotion going throughout them. You feel you feel good thinking about them, recalling them. You've played the the key moments from those movies in your head a thousand times. You know every word of dialogue, blah, 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 blah. We all know how Terry Metalis feels. And he probably thought and felt, quite rightly, that the TNG cast had not had that. They hadn't had that big screen epic story that uh, sequelized the TV show, but was a step up, something different, something bigger. All the TNG movies felt pretty uh, redundant and broad and stupid. They never captured that kind of feel-good um, essence that, that ran through Star Trek 2, 3 and 4. That sense of camaraderie, that sense of friendship tested. Um, and in by being tested, strengthened. And reinforced and I can imagine that Terry Metalis thought I want that for the TNG crew I want them to have an adventure like that unfortunately unfortunately he didn't complete that thought he literalized it he said well actually I'm gonna give them that adventure I'm going to create something that is so reminiscent of those movies. I'm going to incorporate elements of their score, the sound effects, you know, the bosun's whistle, the the galley chimes, the James Horner cue, musical cues, space dark. I'm going to take plot points from those movies and remix them. I'm literally going to use it as a sort of a template. To fill this eight and a half, nine hours of screen time that I have for Picard season three. He literalized the desire to uh, recreate the original series movies. The things that he loved. And in doing so, created a pastiche of them. And in doing so, diminished them retrospectively. Because when you copy something, but you create an inferior copy of it, and you copy it so closely, you um, make that original thing less special retrospectively. Which would have been the last thing that Terry Metalis and co. would have intended. But what it shows is a certain poverty of imagination. You know, he had the right idea. But he executed it in the wrong way. The right idea. Absolutely give Picard and co. An adventure of the, on that scale. Um, that, that gives us those sorts of emotional beats. That lets us feel like we've been through the ringer with them. Break them apart. Put them back together again. Restore everything at the close. So that they effectively end up back where they started but but slightly changed you know slightly evolved from the experience good idea amazing no one's thought of that before the problem is you don't do it by literally plagiarizing material by literally creating a, a patchwork quilt out of the cut up sections of those old movies that's not the way. You think of an original idea. An original idea and then you you surprise the audience. What you're trying to do is recreate the feeling. What you felt when you saw Star Trek 2, 3 and 4. But not literally. Just how it made you feel as a fan, as a viewer. And 
unfortunately, Terry Metallis and co would w- apparently were not equipped to do that. At least maybe not this time, not given the time constraints they were under or the production constraints. So who knows? I'm sure there are a million and one reasons why it couldn't happen. But given that they probably had a complete blank slate and probably the the means to do pretty much whatever they wanted with the TNG cast, once they got them together, agreed that they should star together again, it seems awfully strange to me that they, they didn't think about what can we do with them that's new and exciting that we haven't seen before. Why go for the Borg and the best of both worlds when you've done it? You've done that and first contact in the very last season of Star Trek Picard. I mean, Metallus was on that season. Did he forget that it was about the Borg? You know, it's all very disappointing, isn't it? It's also limiting, because as I said in my blog, sorry, I'm going to repeat something I wrote here. Once you decide that's your template, you impose on yourself a huge series of constraints. The story can only go in a certain direction. It can only have a certain trajectory, because you've already committed to certain plot points. You may have moved them around a little bit, but... You, you don't have that freedom to do anything because that would deviate from your plan, from the thing that you know works. And this is why um, Picard Season 3 reminded me of the other thing that I expected to love but found maddeningly irritating. The Force Awakens. Do you remember The Force Awakens? Yeah, that was a really popular Star Wars movie that grossed more than any other movie ever had um, without adjusting for inflation. But it was a massive hit and it was universally loved by Star Wars fans. Not so much now. Not so much now. But then, oh yeah, even the mo- the even the cynics even Red Letter Media. Well, yeah, it was all right. Quite enjoyed it. Why? Well, The Force Awakens was quite a canny piece of um, of movie engineering. It remade the most popular movie ever made, Bar Gone With The Wind. But it did it under the guise of being a sequel. It was a disguised remake. And disguised remakes have come to be known as legacy sequels. You include characters from the old movies. You tell the same story again. But you introduce a few new young characters. Who do what the old characters did in the previous movies. And you call it a sequel. But actually it's a remake. It's a very safe way of creating a new movie or a new installment in a franchise without doing anything new but while appearing to do something fresh bring in new blood new talent but you haven't actually done anything new and the reason the force awakens was so irritating was because it was essentially an a retread of one of the best known movies ever made. A movie that everybody knows. A movie everyone can recite line by line. They know every shot, every musical cue. Now, if it were me, I would say, but for that reason alone, the last thing in the world we want to do is remake it. Because it will only annoy the audience. The audience don't want that again. They want something new in this universe. They love the universe, but they don't want, need the same story. But, you know, um, stupider heads prevailed, obviously. And through a combination of creative cowardice and um, a certain patronising attitude to the fandom, The Force Awakens is what we got. 
Now, George Lucas was right, by the way, to call The Force Awakens a retro movie. And that was his very polite way of saying it's a copy of something I've already done. And an inferior copy, by the way. And I'm afraid that's how I felt watching Star Trek Picard Season 3. It was retro. It was retro. But, you know, retro is fine if you're talking about getting the Akudas back to do Lacar's panels. And retro is fine if you're talking about continuity of ship design. And retro is fine if, um, you know, you're, you're dropping in the occasional uh, reference to previous episodes and so on. All of that stuff's okay. But when the whole thing is reconstituted from existing material, then you've got a problem. And it may not be apparent to you, dear Trekkies now that there's an issue with it because you're buzzing aren't you you're bu the enterprise d look at it it soared like the millennium falcon through the borg cube and it destroyed the glowing power source in the middle and it got the hell out of there and wasn't data funny in his strange android human hybrid configuration where he's you know a bit a bit human and a bit android you're buzzing today but a week from now, a month from now, a year from now, 20 years from now, if that's when you're watching this video. Well, if you're watching it 20 years from now, you already know, don't you? You already know that there was that period in the 2010s and uh, 20s when TV and filmmakers forgot how to make original material and they cannibalized stuff from the past. Literally. Not in essence, not thematically, but literally. And that period is now looked back on as being a period of, you know, creative impoverishment. But, look, you know this because you have the the wisdom of, of hindsight. We're still in the 2020s. We're still trying to deal with this stuff. So, should it surprise us that um, Picard Season 3 was like The Force Awakens? I would argue no, because when you think about it, there's a lot of connective tissue between the two. Uh, remember that um, The Force Awakens was directed and co-written by J.J. Abrams, the director of those uh, terrible Star Trek movies. And J.J. Abrams' sensibility... In a way, his sort of dumbed down, action heavy sensibility, visual gloss, but cerebral uh, voiding uh, is very much part of the culture of the organisation that he runs, Bad Robot. The TV arm of which is Secret Hideout, which makes, that's right, Star Trek. So, of course, you know, it's part of the company ethos, isn't it? It's part of the production ethos. This, in one way or another, is how Star Trek has been made since um, 2017 on the small screen. And that was still in evidence in Picard Season 3. There was still the sort of grim, dark nature of the material. There was still, you know, the, the profanity and... and little flashes of sadistic violence all toned down a bit because otherwise it would be completely tonally incongruous with the next generation but it was still there still apparent still on screen for us to tut over and wince at and to take us out of the material and so you know it's all part of the culture of production and that culture of production will continue in every iteration of Star Trek as long as it is made by Secret Hideout and as long as these terrible, idiotic people who are in charge of the franchise overall continue to be in charge of the franchise overall, as, as I said in my previous video, until Alex Kurtzman is completely removed from the Star Trek franchise and until it is made by somebody else, preferably by, in-house by Paramount. It will never be free of all of this crap. It will always be in there somehow. 
And in some respects, um, it's not surprising that uh, Metallis et al. went for the legacy formula, quite literally. Because they know it works. They know it works from The Force Awakens. They know it, if, if tweaked, you know, Top Gun Maverick did it very, very well. But this is not a formula for the future. I can't stress that enough. Even if you love The Force Awakens, even if you love Top Gun Maverick, you must surely accept that that is cinema eating itself. That that's um, narrative eating itself. And it's got no future. It is a dead end. There can be no great leap ahead until we put all of this stuff behind us. We can love it and we can uh, have great affection for it. And it can, you know, no understanding how and why it works is important in creating future stories. But they must be original stories. It can't just be an endless recycling of iconography and ideas. Because that is not a formula for progress it is a formula for stagnation and the death of the medium i cannot stress this enough to you and if you don't believe me well again watch this video in 20 years time and we'll see if i was right but you know i know what you're gonna say you're gonna say but hang on a minute hang on a minute doc as I'd like to think you'd call me. If uh, having, if not, you know, cannibalising the past is the way forward, and if it's such a good idea just to sort of uh, go in your own direction, why did Picard season one and two suck? Why were they so terrible? Well, in some respects, it's the wrong question. Picard season one and two were terrible, because the people who wrote them didn't really understand the franchise. And they were riffing off completely different things. Which uh, didn't have any business being associated with Star Trek. They lacked a certain literacy. They lacked a certain amount of imagination. And um, they took the headline old hits. And they tried to reincorporate them. The stuff they knew about Star Trek. And they, they dropped it in. You know, they probably put Seven in there because they'd masturbated over her as a teenager when she was in Voyager. They, that was the character she remembered. I'm old enough to remember when Seven was considered to be a massively patronising sop to an imaginary constituency uh, of, you know, um, half-naked basement dwellers. How do we get how do we get people's attention? Let's put a beautiful woman on the show in a skin tight suit. The groaning could be heard throughout the whole Alpha Quadrant back then. Not that type of groaning either. Groaning of disdain. Is that how little they think of us? We don't need that sort of pandering. The seven, it turned out, was a great character. She is a great character. Jerry Ryan is brilliant in that role. At least in the third season, not the first two, when she slightly forgot who Seven was. But now. But um, Seven came from a bad place. She came from a, a place of trying to appeal to fandom's worst instincts. Um, and in some respects, Picard season three is the same. It's not a compliment to you the fan watching this video, that Picard season three was a polished remix of Star Trek's greatest hits, TNG's greatest hits, with a little bit of DS9 and Voyager sprinkled in there. Because what they're saying to you is, you can't cope with anything new. You, you won't go with it. It has to be dead safe. It has to be something that you know already and that you're happy about already and that you've had time to um celebrate and elevate in your own head canon 
Otherwise, you won't go for it. That's how little they think of you. They think you're stupid. And people will cite Picard seasons one and two as a reason why Terry Metalis's approach was completely correct. But the problem with Picard season one and two wasn't that they told original stories or tried to. Not very well. I mean, it wasn't much originality, but you know what I mean. They went in their own direction. The problem was they didn't know how to tell an original intelligent story in the Star Trek universe. A different set of writers might have turned uh, Picard into something great without the need to bring back the TNG cast. Excuse me, Patrick Stewart's um, directive that it shouldn't be a sequel to TNG and that it should break new ground was the right instinct. It's just unfortunately for us, Patrick Stewart had no idea what that meant. And neither did his writing team. They were all scratching it. What? Sorry, Patrick. I'm, I'm confused. You you don't want us to, to bring back Geordi and Beverly and, and Riker and, and Dada and... Uh, and, and 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 you know all of those guys and the enterprise you don't want that but that's but that's the show well, um, actually no i don't think it is the show i don't know why patrick stewart sounds like roger Moore all of a sudden but you're just wrong with it no i've no idea um uh, i think that uh, those, those things shouldn't be in it I should be in it. But I think it's time to explore Picard's life after he had all of those adventures that people enjoyed. Now that's not necessarily a formula for a flop. You know, Fraser left Cheers, didn't he? And he had a nice time after that. Better call Saul. Terrific prequel. Okay, eventually synced up with Breaking Bad for a little while. It was its own thing. And we had a jolly good time with that, didn't we? It can happen with the right people, the right minds. But not with hacks. Not with people whose only instinct is to self-plagiarise. And plagiarise from better writers. No. So, where does that leave us, kids? Well, I don't know. Up shit creek. You want Star Trek Legacy, don't you? Fuck me. Legacy, literally in the title. Legacy sequel, the series. Star Trek Cobra Kai. With Seven and Raffi and... Jack Crusher being chased around by Q on the Enterprise G, which for budget purposes is the Titan A. Not an exciting ship. Nostalgia class starship. No. Wouldn't, wouldn't it have been wonderful if the reveal of the Enterprise G had been... Oh, look, here it is. Here's the, the second generation of Galaxy class starships. The design's back in favour after the Galaxy class saved all of humanity again. It's not that little fat thing that people hate anymore. They love it. But here it is. We've updated it. We've updated the design for the 25th century. So it's got all of that epic grandeur and technological innovation that blew us all away in uh, Star Trek The Next Generation. But coupled with a few uh, new elements. But there wasn't the time or the money or the imagination to create that ship so let's they slap the g on the titan instead do you want to see that show i bet you do don't you and it could be that it will be great if it's ever made it will be better than starfleet academy or be better than discovery season five it will Almost certainly be better than Strange New Worlds. 
but there's still a little bit of hope with Strange New Worlds, not much. You know, but... Alright, you know, continuity Star Trek. Star Trek set, you know, in, in the timeline that we all know and love. Great, I'll watch it, you'll watch it. But do the writers, based on the evidence presented to us, on the preponderance of evidence, do these people have the nous to create an original Trek when they can't fall back on the stuff they know? You know, or will they be able to take it in a different direction and find their own tone and their own level, as Michael Piller and co. did when they took over TNG? And they were finally able to leave the original series behind them, and they charted their own course, and they understood the unique potential of their own characters. And what they could do with that. I don't know. I don't know. But I'm sceptical. Anyway. I think that's all I wanted to say. Except. To end by answering the question that I asked at the beginning. Star Trek Picard. Was it worth it? No. I don't think so. I think the original ending of All Good Things which was the same scene, was a far better time to jump off uh, the Enterprise D and the Picard and crew. As everything that happened subsequently was reversed, you could do that and it wouldn't really matter, would it? But no, that was sort of perfect. Everything that's come since has been either too bleak, too stupid or too derivative to really matter. In any meaningful sense. All Good Things was the last time. When we really didn't know. What was going to happen next. And we were excited because of it. And. Um, yeah. I guess that's all I have to say really. So thank you for listening. Um, and as uh, a wise man once said. Always wear a condom. And I might see you again, if you're lucky. The Doctor is out. <laughs>